Hi, welcome back. This session I'd like to talk about Icarus and Lazarus. Icarus, for those of you who remember, is the Greek man who managed to make wings out of feathers and wax and flew too close to the sun and then crashed and died. And the other is Lazarus, who, in, at least in biblical terms, rose from the dead. You saying, what's this got to do with stocks? I'd like to use two stocks, GoPro and LinkedIn, two stocks that have had a pretty bad last few months, and talk a little bit about whether they're like Icarus heading down towards Earth and crashing, or whether they're more like Lazarus and they're going to rise from the dead. Let's give you, to give you some perspective, let me look at these two stocks, especially over the context of the last year. These two stocks have dropped substantially. How much? LinkedIn is down about 56% in the last year, Link, uh, and GoPro is down almost 72%. Much of LinkedIn's fall has happened this month. GoPro's been on a long downward slide starting about a year ago. So the question is, now that these stocks have dropped, are they in fact good investments? So let me start with GoPro. GoPro's earnings report came out on February 3rd of 2016 to show you how much this company's expectations have been low, or expectations about this company have been lowered. Analysts were actually expecting revenues to drop because the company has not come up with an upgrade to their Hero 4, which is their, uh, their most recent action camera, and analysts were expecting revenues to drop. The company surprised them with an even bigger drop in revenues than expected, a slightly bigger loss than expected, and worst of all, guidance that these bad times were continuing in the future because the revenue projection, the guidance they gave for next quarter was substantially below expectations. So this is a company that over the last two or three quarters has been not just below expectations, but below very low expectations. The market was spooked, and not surprisingly. The stock dropped almost 19%, or about 20% about of its value dropped off right after the pricing. Now, this is a company that I actually did value two years ago at its very height. It's a company that actually didn't go public that long ago. June of 2014, it went public at $24 per share. It rose as high as $94 per share in October of 2014. And in fact, in October of 2014, right after it hit that height, I did a valuation of GoPro. And the story I told about the company was a pretty simple one. I said, this isn't a camera company. It's really a company that you should think of in the context of smartphones and smartphone accessories. It's an action camera for people who are smartphone users, who are also active on social media. Why the social media connection? Because the video you get from your GoPro camera often gets put online. In fact, GoPro has its own channel where you can see these videos of people going on hikes and climbing mountains or whatever else you do as an active participant in society. So the story I told about GoPro was that it was a company at the leading edge of this new market, that it had the potential to grow its revenues to almost $10 billion over the next decade, that its margins would be pretty healthy given the type of business it was in, and the value that I came up per share with that optimistic story, and I thought it was optimistic, was about $31. So that was two years ago. I must confess, I haven't revisited this valuation very often, but I've been watching the earnings report since, and it's clear that over the last two years, the competition that was imminent that I talked about in October of 2014, competition from not just the established camera companies like Sony, but from newcomers in the business, that competition has turned out to be quicker and more heated than expected, which partly explains the drop off in revenue growth. So having watched the earnings reports, not just the last one, my story going forward is a more pessimistic one. I think there's still a space for GoPro in the future, but with lower revenue growth than I thought. In fact, my end revenues are now going to be closer to four and a half billion than to 10 billion. My margins are going to be less than 10% as opposed to the 12 and a half percent I had before. And there's a very real chance that if the Hero 5, which is their new product coming out, doesn't catch on, that the company might not make it. I've introduced a 20% chance the company will not make it. So with lower revenue growth, lower margins, and a greater chance the company will not make it, I revalue the company. I was pretty pessimistic. I actually made those assumptions, and I expected the value to come in at a low number, and it did come in at a lower number than it was a year ago. A year ago, remember, the value that I got was almost 34 uh, was close to $30.75. Now, when I value the company, the value that I get is about $18, $17.66 to be precise. That's still much higher than the stock price, which was $12.81 when I did this valuation. 
at least based on my assumptions, which were pretty pessimistic, the value that I get for the company is about 35% higher than the market price. And remember, this incorporates a 20% chance that the company will not make it. Take it for whatever it's worth, but the value looks good. So at, the, at the current price, GoPro looks like a decent investment. Now let me turn to LinkedIn. Now LinkedIn in its earnings report actually reported pretty good news. Its revenues came in close to expected. Its earnings came in close to expected. It had a 410 million users, which makes it bigger than Twitter in terms of number of users. But the one negative note in the, in the report was that LinkedIn provided guidance that revenues for the next quarter would be lower than expected. And they gave good reasons, exchange rates, what was happening in the company. The market, though, seemed to see that bad news and the bad news alone. In fact, astonishingly, the stock dropped 40% on the announcement you know, and lost almost $10 billion of market cap on one day. Your first reactions, market's overreacting, let me go buy the stock. Well, that was my first inclination too, but before I made that jump, I decided I should value the company. Now, this is a company where I haven't done a full valuation on my site, on my blog before. I've looked at it in my in my valuation classes. The story I've told about this company, and I've, I've said this even at its height, is this is a social media company unlike most other social media companies. Most of the social media companies are heavily dependent on online advertising. In fact, they get 90, 95, 100% of their revenues from online advertising, a space as we've talked about in the last few posts is dominated by Google and Facebook. LinkedIn gets about 80% of its revenues from the manpower business by connecting employees to businesses, employees to each other, premium subscriptions. It is more a manpower business than an advertising business. And looking at the earnings report, nothing changes about the story. In fact, the story it's telling me is of a fairly active user base, which is using LinkedIn for a very different reason than it's using Twitter. So looking at my valuation coming out of the report, I had pretty optimistic assumptions about revenue growth and margins. The revenue growth I'm going to give them is, um, is going to yield revenues which are close to 15 billion in, in 10 years. So I'm, I am giving them pretty substantial revenues. The margins I'm giving them are lower than the margins I would give a Twitter or a Facebook, which are online advertising, because the nature of their business is going to give lower margins. And the value that I got per share was about $104 per share. Now, the price, the stock price was actually $112.50 when I did the analysis. Not massively overvalued, pretty close to fair value, but if I'm tilting, I'm tilting more towards overvaluation than undervaluation. So I must confess, I was a little disappointed. I was hoping that LinkedIn's value would come in below the price, that I could tell you this nice story about how everything tied together and I bought LinkedIn, but it was not to be. There is one point I want to make. With both LinkedIn and GoPro, there is at least the sense that there's a floor on the value. Why? Because there's somebody else who will come in and buy them. Somebody will buy GoPro's camera technology. Somebody will buy LinkedIn's 410 million users. I'm not so sure about the GoPro story, but I do agree that there might be somebody out there who really, really wants 410 million users. After all, remember, Facebook paid $22 billion for WhatsApp, 450 million users when they had no revenues and no earnings. So to make a judgment on whether this would make a difference to my valuation, here's what I decided to do. I went into my simulation on the previous page. So in this simulation, I basically allowed for the fact that the value could drop to whatever it drops to, given what revenue growth and margins and cost of capital did. And the values actually drop off to 34, 35. With really bad scenarios, the value can be low. If I introduce an acquisition floor, the question I have to ask is, how do I come up with that floor? And here's how I decided to at least do a, an experimental analysis. Right now, it, it, you look across social media companies, the market's paying about $80 per user. In other words, if I take the market cap of every social media company divided by the number of users, you've got about $80 per user. Clearly, if you've got $80 per user for 410 million users, then somebody's going to pay $33 billion, then we're home free. You should just buy LinkedIn and hope that somebody buys it. I don't think you're going to get that lucky. So let's assume that the floor is 20 cents. So basically, if the value of LinkedIn drops to 8.2 billion, that somebody will come in, or 8 billion, somebody will come in. But here's the catch, the floor is not an absolute floor. What I mean by that is you can't leave it at 8 billion no matter what happens to LinkedIn. If revenue growth is lower than expected, and monetization doesn't work the way you expected, I'd expect that floor to go lower. 
if things are better than expected, high revenue growth. So what I did was I went into my simulation, put in an acquisition floor of eight billion, but tied that for eight billion. Actually, I gave it a range of 4 to 12 and tied where you fell in the range to what the revenue growth and margins would be. So if I got a draw, because the simulation each time you draw from a distribution, I get a draw of low revenue growth and a low margin. Then I also set the acquisition flow closer to 4 billion than to 8 billion. If I get a high revenue growth and a high margin, I set it closer. So I revalue the company with the acquisition flow. Now, the medians don't change. Obviously, the distribution is the distribution. My base case value stays the same at $103.5. But here's what's different. Because I've introduced the floor, the mean price, which is the average across all my simulations, rises about $1.87 per share. That's much less than you thought, right? That's low, that's, that's, it's low, but it's low because I've set the floor at $8 billion. If you think you can get $0.50 cents on the user, $0.40 cents on the user, you come up with $16, $18, 20000000000 billion, obviously the effect on your value will get greater. If you assume it's an absolute floor, in other words, somebody will pay that number no matter what your revenue growth and margins is, the effect of the floor is much greater. So it is a function of my assumptions, but it's actually an, a template you can use anytime you want to think about a company where you think an acquisition can provide a floor on your value. It's not a conventional option. I've seen people use an option pricing. It's not a conventional option because the, the floor itself can shift depending on how well or badly you're doing as a company. So let me close off this discussion with a confession. Before I valued GoPro on LinkedIn, I really, really wanted to have LinkedIn as my pick on this post. So I had priors. I had preconceptions. I knew I had priors. In fact, I wrote it down and put it right in my desk saying, remember, you're biased towards LinkedIn. And I'm sure, and, and my bias towards LinkedIn comes from all the things I've talked about. The fact that it's not just an online advertising, the fact that it's a manpower business, and this may seem like a strange thing, but I like LinkedIn because I cannot think of the name of its CEO right off the top of my head. It's a company where the top management actually has done what it's supposed to do, run the company and not be in social media or be out in the public space. Because that's not the same thing you can say about a lot of social media companies where the CEOs are public media stars. They're out there and they have drawing power beyond the company. I like LinkedIn. I really do like LinkedIn as a company. Unfortunately, in spite of my biases, and I'm sure they affected my numbers, I'm sure I'm bending over backwards to give bad numbers for GoPro and good numbers for LinkedIn. I came up with numbers for my valuation that actually went against my priors. I thought about tweaking the numbers to make them match my priors, but that's how we get into trouble. So I'm going to leave it as is, which effectively means that I still wish I bought, uh, I, uh, that I have linked in my portfolio, but at current prices, it doesn't quite fit in. And much as, I, uh, much as GoPro makes me uneasy, the management is a little out there in terms of not having a story that's consistent, that they deliver. The company is a single product company in an electronics business where a competitor can wipe them out. In spite of all those worries, which I've built into my valuation, I think GoPro is what fits into my portfolio. I hope I don't live to regret it, but I've done the best I can. Thank you very much for listening.